Hey there, I'm Misha with Cypress Pillar Healing Arts, the certified clinical herbalist, Reiki master, and kind of big plant nerd for the space. And today I want to introduce you to my old friend, Glasswort. These are plants in the Salicornia genus, and I just can't wait to share this plant with you. So let's meet it. Glasswort is in the amaranth family, amaranthaceae, and it is a really unique plant. It's halophytic, which means it can survive in salt conditions. And it's also succulent, so you can think of it as being like a cactus or just a general succulent plant in general that has the ability to store lots of water and sequester it in its specialized leaves and other plant body parts. In general, the Salicornia species look like almost like little fingers poking up from the salt marsh soil. You can tell them because they'll be thick, they look kind of juicy, and they're jointed in appearance. And if you do happen to break or crush them, or if you step on them, it does sound a little bit like glass breaking, which is one of the ways that it got its name. In Florida, we have two different types of Salicornia, the Biglovia, which is the annual glass, glasswort, which you see right here, and then also Salicornia ambigua, which is the perennial glasswort. Now, the Biglovia will grow more like, almost like a little tree. You'll see a little branching come off of it, off the main plant. And then the Ambigua tends to grow more almost as if it's coming from runners, or it is coming from runners. So you'll see individual single plants popping up, almost like little fingers out of the ground. Plants are light green to yellow green, and you might notice that there is some red here. And sure enough, as it gets cooler and turns more to the fall, the plants will turn a beautiful red purple color, but some of them have red year round as well. Okay, so I'm hanging out with my friend, Salicornia, and you might be looking at this going, I don't know, Misha, that does not look super exciting, but hear me out. So. This plant, oh, there we go, right over here, Salicornia. If we think about the common names, it tells us a lot about the value of this plant. One of those names is glasswort, and we'll get into how it got that amazing name in a minute. But there are some names that really give us a clue into its edible uh, like availability and its edible history. Things like sea asparagus, also sea bean, pickleweed, marsh pickle, and sea pickle. Now, some of those names like sea pickle, pickle in particular are used for some of the other plants that often grow with the glasswort. So, you know, common names, you always wanna make sure that you're, um, you know exactly which plant you have. That's why we use the Latin names, right? But those names are great clues that give us some insight on just how important this plant could be as a food source. And let me tell you, it is packed with vitamins and minerals stuff that you wouldn't even imagine could be in this tiny little plant. Things like vitamin A, vitamin B1, vitamin B15, potassium, calcium, and even things like iodine that are not always super bioavailability available to us. The iodine makes total sense though, right? Because it's growing in super salty soil. And even early sailors understood the potential value of this plant. And we have evidence that they would pack it up and take, a, take it with them on long sea journeys because it did have so much nutritional value. It's also like, if you eat it, it's very, very salty. And so, yeah, you get, you get some of that as well. So super great in terms of the nutrients and the minerals in this plant. So you might be curious about how this guy tastes. So I have snapped off the teeniest, tiniest little tip. It's about the length of the tip of my pinky finger. And I made sure to do it without having any type of an impact on the land. I'm not harvesting buckets of it. So just this tiny little piece. And I was able to do it without jumping the boardwalk, anything like that. So you can see it right here. It's super tiny. And actually, if you look at it, it totally looks like an asparagus tip. Now, to me, things like Smilax, the, the, um, the Greenbrier, cat, uh, cat Claw, even though we use that common name for another one as well, um, th that guy tastes like asparagus to me. This one does not, but I'll go ahead and try it for you so you can get an idea of what it tastes like. So, oh, it's crunchy. And as soon, <laughs> the salt is kicking in. Ooh, like if you ever go to the ocean and you swallow some salt water, that's what that ooh was. It was that that little like kick in the face um, of the salt, the salt water coming in. It tastes a lot like ocean water, but the it also has a very um, flavorful, kind of deep green um, 
almost almost like a spinach right so that 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 really like grounding yummy green flavor but as if you took that and soaked it in the ocean <laughs> that's kind of what this tastes like and one of the things that's really neat about it is it is crunchy so from living in the salt marsh it has those salt crystals and like if i if i were to come really close and you know chew in front of you which i won't do it makes a really great crunchy sound i love it it's so fun and it really does have a high water co con uh, content in it so that's a great part of this plant as well if you decide that you want to try this plant make sure that you get the fresh green tips and watch out for the red parts or the woody parts there's some belief that the red parts especially have a lot of salt in them and so it might not be super tasty and also they can have some silica in them so you don't want to have any type of mouth irritation or any type of irritation for your digestive system they can be eaten raw but again because they can have that silica in there we want to make sure that if you do eat them raw you're getting the freshest greenest newest growth otherwise you will want to cook this one Glasswort has long been a plant that has served humans, both medicinally and in a variety of other ways. It gets its name not just because if you step on it, it sounds like glass, but because it was actually a huge component of both glass making and soap making. When the plant is burned, because it has so much sodium in it, that can easily be transferred into either soda ash or pot ash. And depending upon the quantity of the sodium that's in the plant, that will either give you the pot ash if it's not very high or if it's got a lot of salt in it sequestered in the plant, then it will give you the soda ash. And we've actually have evidence that since the 16th century, this plant was used in both glass making and soap making because of its ability to be transformed into these ingredients for both of those processes. Medicinally, there is a lot of evidence to indicate that salicornia is able to address a wide variety of issues. The important thing to understand though is that the studies that have been done on the efficacy of the plant have worked with a lot of different species. So we don't really have one study that has really conclusively proven this species works on everything. But we do have evidence that it is an amazing plant for histamine reaction. It is antihistamine. It can, especially when applied topically, it can help with dry, itchy skin. We also have studies that have shown that is analgesic and can help with pain from arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis in particular. The plant is also known to be anti-diabetic, hepatoprotective to help fight and modulate immune issues. And there's also evidence that it is antibacterial as well, not necessarily working against gram positive bacteria, but really helping, especially for conditions where we have things that are getting to be more and more immune and resistant to antibiotics. So there's a lot of exciting possibility for working with this plant medicinally. And I really wanna also acknowledge, like I try to always do in these videos, that this is stuff that we're kind of discovering now, but many of the indigenous people in North America, especially in the Pacific Northwest and in around Alaska, they knew that the value of the plant for these reasons, as did a lot of our sailors that knew how to work with this plant as well. One of the really wonderful things about this plant is that it truly grows in the place where the land and the water meet. So it's a plant that is super duper, just like built to be living in harsh conditions. This is really the closest we get in Florida to a desert. So this is a place where the soil is really salty. So the plants that grow here have to be salt tolerant. If you look behind me, there's some mangroves back there, but they are super short. This particular site that I'm at, I've been working here for 10 years, coming here, visiting it. I helped to build it. And these mangroves, none of this was planted. This is all natural. And you can hear we're actually pretty close to a pretty busy road, but everything that you see behind me all came up on its own. And the mangroves are the same age as everything else, but because this area is so salty, only things that can handle that like high salinity and the occasional influx of both salt water and fresh water when we get rains, only those will survive. And saltwort, or excuse me, glasswort, is a great example of that. 
there's also saltwort out here. There's also sea purslane. We typically find those three growing together and it's just a really diverse, exciting community. So this is a really great example of exactly where the salicornia likes to live. If you look here, it's a little hard to tell, but plant friends, you can probably note that we have some of our native Florida wild cotton or uplands cotton growing in with some different other plants and trees that we would expect to find in an uplands. But right here, there's a little creek, bre creek, uh, creek bed that runs through. And this little ephemeral wetland, which means it's not wet all of the time, just sometimes. And so right here, we have a patch of the glasswort of salicornia growing. But then as soon as we move a little bit more to the right, we've got buttonwood and more of that wild cotton. So once it gets a little too high and a little too dry, we won't see it. But again, if we turn to our left where it's a little bit lower elevation, there's some, let me get around the, the buttonwood, there's some growing right there where it stays pretty wet and pretty salty. This all drains out to Sarasota Bay. So it gets a pretty decent amount of salt water here. And then we also have this area right here that, and you could probably, we don't want to, because of course we don't want to jump off the boardwalk, but if we followed this all the way back through here, we would probably, you can kind of see this green path goes all the way through, cuts through and then cuts off this way. It would easily lead us out to the water pretty quickly. And then of course, when we have higher tides or even heavy rainfall, a lot of that, that salt water does link back in here. And so we get the glass wart. So right here we have what is pretty much a classical salt marsh type area. You can see that we have a real progression from the mangroves where the soil is a little bit easier for them to grow. Of, of course, they can grow right up against the water's edge too, but here to the soil where we have some different types of marsh grass, disticulus and different types of paspalum there, that's the low grassy looking stuff. And then we actually have one of our wildflowers coming in are sea oxeye daisy. That's the little yellow flowers you can see right here. See them popping in. And then as we get wetter, well, not completely wet all the time, but it gets a little bit wetter and a lot more saltier, we have a little salt pan here or salt turn that is not so salty, like the things are able to, to live. So we've got our glasswort. You can probably, uh, spotted there. There's some Spanish moss on the ground that's blown in from some of the trees. But this guy right here is our sea purslane. And then we even have little baby mangrove trees popping up. So you can see there's some baby mangroves in there as well. And then some more of that sea oxide daisy. There's actually also some salt wort popping up as well. So we've got the glass wort, the salt wort, and the sea purslane as well. And as we move out elsewhere in the land, you can see as we get higher, there's actually some, some um, cedars back there. There's some oaks, but here where it's low and super salty, this is really the only stuff that will grow. So you might notice that I am on a boardwalk and the glass wart is actually on either side of the boardwalk. Does that mean that I can jump off and grab it? No, and that's another reason why I really wanted to make this video. There is so much awesome work being done right now with foraging and wild crafting and harvesting and just everybody, like the medicine getting to the people and that's awesome. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of these plants that are very sensitive or that grow in sensitive areas and glasswort and saltwort and sea purslane, all of those guys all kind of fall under that, under that category. The salt marsh behind me is a very sensitive area. The, uh, the sand that you see out there, when you just see it, when it's just an all patchy sand, that's called a salt turn. The plants coming up all around it in the marsh area, um, when we have areas where it's not just straight up marsh grass, like paspalum, or some of the things that we would expect to find, maybe where the, letter, the water is a little bit less salty, so like our juncus, like our rushes, this area is very sensitive. So it's very sensitive to impacts. So a lot of times here in Florida, you'll find places where a boardwalk goes through it. 
that's so that you can enjoy it, so that you can see the plants, so that you can inter interact with them, be around them and enjoy their presence without stomping all over them. And believe it or not, it may sound kind of crazy, but believe it or not, just one person or two people jumping off and walking through this can really damage the habitat. So um, I don't want to be a downer and, and, um, and um, uh, Heart, like like kind of squelch anybody's enjoyment of nature, not at all. But just know that when you see these areas and when there is a boardwalk going through, it is often put there intentionally so that you can stay on the path and not potentially harm any of the sensitive plants. And glassworts are a great example of that. We actually, the, the two species of, of salicornia that we have here in Florida, some of them are very, like both of them actually are pretty rare. They're only found in like the very edge of the coastal state. And one of them, uh, Salicornia biglovia is only found in a handful of counties. So these are very, very unique plants. They're pretty rare. And today I'm gonna teach you about their medicinal values as well as their edible values. But of course, we wanna make sure that if we're harvesting them, we do so in places where we are allowed to do 